Hi everyone, my name is Ram Venkatrami. I'm part of the Edge Compute team at uh, VMware. I lead our Edge Innovation Organization. Been with VMware for about eight years. Um, and this is Anthony Sivison. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Certainly, yeah. So Anthony Sivison, I work for Salt River Project or with them. Um, I've been an engineer there for, for many years in the protection automation control group, and I'll explain more about that in just a little bit. So. Great, thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Um, just before I get into the presentation and meat of the content, just by a show of hands, how many of you from utilities, particularly power utilities? Wow, that's really nice to see so many of you. And how many of you are from vendors who serve the utility customer base? Okay, one. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That really helps us set the context as we go into the content. Um, so. This is a standard disclaimer, so I'm going to uh, quickly go through that. So one of the things that I do want to talk about uh, before actually diving specifically into the utility is the impact that AI, particularly AML, is having in multiple industries across the board, particularly when it comes to apply application of AI in the edge. There is a lot of use cases, definitely in utilities. Many of you may probably resonate with what I'm going to be saying next. Like when you're talking about all these balancing the grid kind of challenges, now being able to collect all the data that has been generated in the edges and be able to analyze it to figure out what is the best way to deliver uh, uh, power in an efficient manner is a critical component, is a critical objective that many utilities are grappling with today. Uh, so one of the key things that we do have as part of our software defined edge offering is a three layered stack that kind of provides you the foundation layer for building this edge AI capabilities. So at the bottom layer, we have the network uh, uh, assets. So because most of the things, I mean, it's today, even though most of these equipments at the edge are developing, I mean, generating these statistics, it's not being consumed and analyzed because, the, because of the challenges that you face in the network. So the network specific capabilities that we have in SDE kind of addresses that layer. And we have an intelligent overlay in the middle, which essentially optimizes the network connectivity in such a way that it can provide intelligence to what is the data that is being generated. And on the top, we have the edge compute where you run all your analytical functions uh, to make sense out of the data that is being generated. So this is a very small segue that I just wanted to quickly talk about before we actually jump to the actual topic, which is uh, essentially how uh, utilities, particularly power utilities, are leveraging uh, digit, uh, digitization and digital modernization uh, to uh, make their own operations much more efficient. Okay, so some of the common OT challenges, right, that we see in the power utilities. I think many of this is going to be very uh, 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 standard for you guys. Today we see a lot of power generation across the board, right? So today in US, for example, we are consuming close to about 740 gigawatts of electricity. That's across the board in US. And what the national uh, electricity, I mean, Department of Energy has come out with is by 2030, they need to add 60 additional gigawatts of capacity because the demand is going to be close to around 800 gigawatts by 2030. That's a massive increase in power generation in such a short period of time. I mean, if you really compute the numbers, it comes close to about eight to nine percent. Adding eight to nine percent capacity means you need to not only add power generation units, but also need to invest in power transmission, power distribution, all across the board. Right, and that means faster deployment cycles, uh, fast, uh, and all all such things. Right, so that's a key challenge that we are faced with today. The second thing is from the utilization standpoint or from the consumption standpoint. One of the major changes that we have seen in the last decade is the proliferation or adoption of electric vehicles. Right, today in U.S. we have close to about three million electric vehicles. Again, the projection is by 2030, this is going to increase to 33 million electric vehicles. 33 million electric vehicles, 10x the time that you see today in, in, in US roads. And that is calling for 
deployment of close to about 28 million EV chargers, both at home as well as in public. 28 million EV chargers, which means 28 million setups which is going to be feeding high power electricity, right? Because for you to charge the EVs at 240 volts or 440 volts, you need that kind of a delivery capacity or a distribution capability in the grid as well. So that's what we are grappling with. And now another interesting factoid is the adoption of solar power. So who, homes or residences which were traditionally net consumers are now becoming net producers. Right? So you're seeing homes adding capacity or electricity into the grid. Whereas the grid, which was designed maybe 20, 30 years ago, was primarily designed for a one-way delivery model, one-dimensional delivery. Generate the power in your gas stations or in your nuclear power plants and deliver the electricity to the homes. Never did they dream about the scenario where, hey, these consumers who are going to be the recipients of the electricity that I'm producing are now going to be adding electricity back to the grid. Now, what kind of impact that's having on the utility? And what do, we, what do they need to do to accommodate for this dynamism that they have never ever witnessed in the past three, four decades? That's really the challenge that the utilities are facing with today. And what, uh, and, uh, what we are going to be talking about in the session is one way by which we can make the utility resilient enough to address these challenges. By this alone, it's not going to address the challenge completely, but you get the foundation by which you can address these challenges, right? So, so we, this is another scenario, right? So there is a lot of mismanagement that is happening because of weather related changes. Uh, and some of the uh, traditional IT approaches also is not something that is going to be uh, 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 relevant for this dynamic uh, scenario, right? Uh, with all these power changes happening. So, uh, so some of the key problems that I see that the utilities are facing today. One, we talked about it, which is slow pace of substation deployment. As I mentioned, 60 gigawatts need to be added in the next six years. I don't know how many substations that translates to. Today, if you want to put a new substation, you need to spend time in acquiring the land, acquire the uh, equipment, construct the substation plant, staff it. Easily, we are talking about six to nine months. How many substations and how much time do we have to be able to add this 60 gigawatts capacity? It's not much. So we have to make, accelerate the pace of deployment of substations. Similarly, physical constraints. Most of the substations today, if you open up the cabinet, they are stacked with a lot of proprietary appliances, which is extremely good. It worked well in the past. But in the current dynamic nature of the power grid, is that the right architecture that we need to leverage? That's a question that we all need to sit and answer seriously. Third challenge is the impact of distributed energy resources. We talked about EV charges. We talked about solar, pa solar uh, uh, panels in every rooftop. How are you going to accommodate for the impact that it is having on the grid? That's the third one. Then we have lack of inferencing. I talked about AJI in the beginning of the session, right? Most of the times, utilities are finding it hard to balance the grid because they don't know how to balance the grid. It's not that they don't have techniques to balance the grid. It's just that they don't have visibility into the data points, visibility into the statistics that are generated in the substation, generated in the inverters that are running, that are in your household to make sense out of those information to balance the grid with an efficient algorithm. Algorithms exist. Mechanisms are there, but there is no way to feed the data, process the data, and take actions on the data. That is where the gap is. So now somehow we need to figure out and address this gap in a, meaning, in a very short period of time. The last one is operational complexity of any solution deployment. I mean, you go to any utility and talk about, okay, hey, I want to add a new substation. How long does it take for you to get the approval and get it functioning? It's a pretty long time. I mean, I granted it's a very critical infrastructure. You cannot roll it out like a normal edge, nano edge site when it's not that easy. I understand that. But still, that pace, the traditional pace of rolling out things cannot be continued in future because of the demands that are rising as like a hockey stick. That's where the challenges 
that that's where the challenge is and that's what we want to address by digitizing the entire utility infrastructure so let me turn it over to anthony he will walk you through some of the key uh, exercises that they did in srp and give some uh, information around the testing that they did all right thank you ram <clears throat> excuse me uh, so Maybe to give you a little bit of background about SRP first, um, Salt River Project uh, is in the Phoenix metro area, covering the most of it. Um, we have um, over 1.1 meters. That's not the number of customers, but that's the number of uh, paying meters. Um, about uh, a little over eight gigawatts in demand, and that's gigawatts, not gigawatts, unless you're in Back to the Future. Um, but we are about a medium-sized utility then, so that's about a quarter of the nation's largest utilities. I got some smiles there, that's good. You guys are awake after lunch. Um, so um, I guess before I get into this, were any of you able to attend the manufacturing uh, session with Audi earlier today? Nobody here? Just the one? Okay, two, yes, of course. So um, I was gonna draw some parallels to it, but uh, we'll keep this utility focused. There are some parallels in the workloads though that we can uh, draw a correlation to. Um, this is going to, my part of the presentation really, and I'll dig into the details, Ram did a good job of going a high level, um, but dig into the details of protection automation control. Um, so hopefully the, you from utilities understand what that is. Um, really, uh, we uh, design, um, install, operate, and maintain the devices that are at the front line of the grid. So. Um, these are the devices that are responsible for maintaining the reliability. They're going to operate the equipment that isolates faults. Um, it um, keeps you know the public safe, keeps our equipment safe, very expensive equipment, of course, right? Um, and helps you know keep the lights on for you, right? So um, keep that in mind as we go through, and you know it is very detailed about that particular subject. But why would we virtualize? You know, PAC is arguably one of the hardest use cases in the utility to virtualize, um, but there's really a lot of benefits to be had when we move down that road. Um, we can reduce the number of devices. That, that really is what started us on this journey in the first place. Uh, it's about eight years ago. Um, the group that I was in took a hard look at our life cycle management plans and realized that we were already underwater. Um, we had way too many devices and way too few people uh, to manage this huge fleet. So uh, we started down the road of centralized protection and control, or CPC. Um, and, and really that, that did some good, but we realized very early on that that was not going to be good enough. So we started looking at virtualization and talking to partners um, some eight years ago. Um, but, you know, when we go down this road, we realize that we're going to be able to, of course, reduce the devices, simplify our asset management, and that's going to come from the increased remote capabilities um, we don't have today. We still have to get a lot of hands on those uh, proprietary uh, boxes that Rom mentioned, relays, and uh, other assets. Um, and also the automation that comes from centrally managing um, a, a fleet of uh, virtualized devices or software-defined devices. Um, inevitably, this is going to decrease labor costs. Um, you'll see in a couple slides uh, what our equipment looks like today, and it'll become obvious um, that that's very labor-intensive to install, um, which leads to the safer physical edge environment. Um, you'll see those dangerous touch points, wires all over the place um, today that will start to disappear as we move down this road too. Um, We'll improve standardization. That's really going to come from the smaller footprint. So when we collapse everything down to a server and uh, I.O. in the form of merging units, we can install basically the same equipment regardless of the configuration of the station, um, switchyard substation that we're putting this in. And interoperability, when we use you know, a software-defined layer like VMware, um, we can install different vendors, choose best in class, and put that all in the same place versus the boxes, which different fit form, different I.O., right? So if we switch from one vendor to another, we have to change the way we do things, change our standards. Hopefully we don't have to do that. Um, and then, of course, the data. So the data feeds into the high-level stuff that Ram mentioned. Um, we'll be able to collect more of that um, and start to realize new algorithms at the edge. Um, and feed our centralized management systems like ADMS, which is advanced distribution, distribution management systems, with more data, which they're asking for now, so they can do a better job operating at the center. So our transformation probably isn't radically different than other people's, um, but what may be different for utilities is that uh, we're kind of stuck between phase one and two still. Um, we have electromechanical devices that are still in the field. Um, these are devices that are decades old, older than me even, um, 
and we've, we've been installing microprocessor relays since the 80s, early 90s, um, and they offered you know, a, a huge improvement in uh, function and reduced from dozens of devices that it takes to operate or, or protect um, a, a power system element down to um, you know, one for, for those dozens. And then we expect that same sort of transformation as we move into the single appliance, um, which would be the server hosting applications um, like PAC and then the adjacent applications that would support that. But obviously we're gonna get new flexibility. Um, so that's gonna come in the form of being able to install you know, a piece of software instead of trying to implement a new function with a new box, right? Um, scalability, we can leave headroom so that we can scale out as the station scales out. Um, and manageability, we already talked about, comes in the form of centralized management and more automation um, from that. So what does it look like for us today? I promised to show you, this is our current standard. Um, this is CPC for us, centralized protection control. Uh, there's still a lot of wires, right? Um, it's a big box, um, and these, these wires carry dangerous signals. It's currents, it's potentials. Um, you have to be trained and skilled to be able to touch any of this, right? Um, on the front is still controls in some cases, um, and all that is going to be you know, whittled down into the future in, uh, into a server. Um, and really, to be fair, this picture only represents about the bottom third of one of our standard panels. Um, there's more to that up above. Um, and we can actually fit a minimum of, I'd say, four of those panels into one of these servers that would cover um, basically all of our low voltage uh, standard distribution station, uh, which is significant. So to give you a little bit better idea of what our stack looks like, on the left here, we've got um, a very high level view. Um, we've got the high voltage substation apparatus at the bottom, that would be circuit breakers, transformers, uh, et cetera, uh, fed uh, secondary signals into merging units that would then translate the analogs to digitals, right, uh, into a physical network that feeds servers um, where, of course, VMware ESX is installed, which hosts applications, um, not just PAC, but other adjacent applications that will need to support substation uh, work. Um, that's pretty much where the IT, or I'm sorry, OT stack ends. Then we feed into our uh, operations center, grid control centers, how it's labeled here. But um, we call that SCADA, right? Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Um, and, and that still exists. That's where the ADMS that I talked about is um, and other uh, support. But all the data starts at you know, our devices and, and that substation apparatus. Um, on the right, you'll see a, a picture of the VPAC Alliance members. Um, this is a group that SRP helped found. Um, we have a lot of you know, SRP members that, that are chairs and even the steering committee um, is represented by that. Um, we're, we're developing specifications right now with you know, all these members, um, which would eventually become standards. And for utilities, standards bodies are IEEE and IEC. Um, within the group, we can share experience with other utilities. So we've got a, sort of a impromptu user group in there. Um, we can provide feedback directly to any of these vendors and they can work with each other as we do in our working groups. Um, and of course that is you know, kind of um, fostering interoperability, right? Because we're all on the same page, we're all working towards the same specifications. So now the fun part, uh, the testing that we've been doing. So uh, we've had a lab project um, in place since about this time last year. Um, most of the components were, were in place. I would say we really didn't hit the ground running until about December of last year. Um, and we had just a few high-level objectives for that lab pilot. Of course, this is going to expand, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. But um, we started out with just wanting to meet the functionality of the devices that we have today. So, um, you know, we're not going for a grand scale yet, although we know this is going to be able to provide a lot more functionality in the future. But we, we're taking this opportunity to train our personnel um, about how the technology looks because this is a drastic change from, from what we do today. The OT side is not familiar with you know, VMware, let alone anything else, any of the practices, um, which you'll see in some of the testing that we're, we're doing, um, trying to get people familiar. But it gives us a chance also to do or to look at the best practices on, on how we will install this with legacy systems, right? The, the systems that we're going to have to partially carry forward as we install these in the field. 
Um, we've been regularly collaborating, I already mentioned, with partners, uh, VMware One, ABB, and, other, um, and others. And you'll see a list of components here of the, the things that we have in the lab to support this, this lab project. Uh, pr probably none of it surprising, a lot of components maybe you've heard of, especially if you work in substations um, or for utilities. I won't read through the whole list, but um, the beginning. So, of course, we got to spec components, right? So, I'm glad we have a lot of utility folks here. We don't have to explain, hopefully, a lot of this, but uh, maybe I'll go into just a little bit of detail. You know, a hardware's uh, the hardware is a server, but it's not just a server, right? It has to be rugged if it's going to go at our edge, which is a substation. So, it has to be withstanding of high temperatures. It has to meet, uh, you know, the the dusty environment. The, these are usually um, dusty, shock, vibration proof, et cetera. So they have to meet 62850-3 certification at a minimum, ideally eventually meeting IEEE 1613 certification. Um, we're going in with active cooling in the beginning, which would be fans, um, and in the hopes that eventually we'll see some, some larger footprint uh, passively cooled servers. Um, our aux power systems, you know, DC, but up to 125 volts, and that's not super common in, in the IT side of the business right now. Um, so making sure we meet those power supplies. Signal generation is merging units. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, the protocols that we need there. Um, of course, physical network devices are very similar for, from what we've been using, but now that we're getting into 61850, um, you know, they have to facilitate those protocols, so a little bit different usage. And then satellite clocks, of course, we need highly precise time, um, so translated into PTP onto our networks. The configurations, um, they are 62850 based for the most part, which is kind of the common denominator across all this architecture. Um, I wish there was some overarching tool that uh, covered every vendor, but there really isn't. We have to use all the vendor's tools at the moment, um, but, but hopefully someday that'll come together just a little bit more. Um, the right-hand side really just explains that, you know, we set things up, we don't want to take anything for granted. Um, reach steady state operation, which we had a pilot four years ago that couldn't maintain steady state operations, so that's why that's a bullet point on there. Um, do preliminary health checks, so that's a manual process now as we have our lab set up. Um, but eventually that would feed into our SCADA system. Um, in terms of protocols, uh, you know, ITOT doesn't necessarily use the same, but there are some common ones like SNMP and syslog that we can use instead of doing conversion. Um, and then, of course, get this set up and get everything talking to each other. Um, signal generation in the lab is not from high voltage equipment, of course, but we can simulate the signals either by injecting secondary or by just straight out uh, simulating those 62850 signals. So what does our configuration look like? I apologize for the really small image, but I wanted to give you guys the genuine um, Visio diagram that we used to start our lab pilot. So this is it. Um, we have uh, redundant servers, A and B. They have ESX8, uh, a little bit older version on them right now, but we intend to, as part of our testing, you know, update that, of course. Um, so patching is, is in there. Um, these have, uh, they are hardened, so that's the Dash 3 certification. Uh, they have specialty NICs, so this has to handle the protocols we need, parallel redundancy protocol and precision time protocol. Um, and uh, that feeds directly to, you can't see the words necessarily, probably have a laser pointer on here, but the dark uh, blue is our PAC applications fed PCI pass-through at the moment. So we don't use the virtual network for the PAC applications, um, but hopefully in the future the, the virtual switches will be able to facilitate the protocols that we need. Um, so right now to get the speed that we need it is PCI pass-through. We do have a management server on the right there, so we're using vCenter at the moment, although looking forward to using um, Veco in the future. Um, we intend to use vSAN, but um, we have some limitations in the applications and their licensing, so we don't want to move things around at the moment. Uh, still a lot of benefits to be had here. Of course, we don't need real-time in the management server, just in the redundant servers. The physical network, um, pretty common. Again, we use switches that we would have before. I will say there's a large mix of speeds here, um, anywhere from 10 gigs all the way down to um, 100 megs, which a lot of our merging units are still using. Um, and then PTP. I don't know how many of you have to deal with PTP, but it's not always easy, right? Every component in the stack should support it uh, that's going to, uh, you know, carry it along to the pack application. So that starts at the merge unit. Uh, the switch has to act as a clock. Um, and then we deliver that into the NICs and then on into the pack application. Um, I promised to talk just a little bit about the merging units and their protocols. Um, so 92LE, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with sampled values, but uh, there's really 
two main protocols. Uh, 92LE, to be fair, is not a standard, it's a guideline, but that's the predominant um, way to uh, publish sample values today. 9-9 is a far more efficient protocol, which we're looking forward to using, um, and even has a lower bandwidth. Um, but uh, basically, it's a mix of the signals, uh, currents and voltages, um, and uh, it is a duplicate uh, sampling within the packet, uh, so you get much, much more efficiency. Okay, so um, being from a utility in the pack group, we're used to just buying devices off the shelf. That hardware device uh, was already tested by the manufacturer, by the vendor, right? So um, if I buy a relay, I expect it to perform, um, you know, perform well. I don't need to test it. They already did that. Uh, so I put in some settings. Maybe I'll have a special algorithm that I have to test the latency for and the functionality of. But now that we've broken this stack out, we've got hardware, we've got a software-defined layer, and we have applications, we need to make sure that whenever we change a component or change a setting in the hardware and the software-defined layer, that we reprove that we haven't introduced any added latency. I mean, we need speed here, and you'll see that in the next slide with some of our results, or I'm sorry, two slides from now. So we did cyclic testing. Um, this is uh, on our server, it's ESX8, and then a Linux VM in place of where the pack application would be. And you know, we run this for long periods of time, 24 hours is relatively short, but we're looking for anything uh, under 100 microseconds, and we're really interested in the max, not necessarily the mean. The mean is good, five microseconds, but that 65 or, or above is what worries us. So we wanna keep that as low as possible. We'll make sure we didn't introduce any long tail latency in uh, any of the settings. Okay, so getting into the end-to-end -end testing, we um, set up in our lab both architectures. So the test sets that you see here that says times four, uh, I didn't put the brand in here, but these are physical uh, test sets that are all synch synchronized together via PTP. Um, they're, they're actually the same test sets, so we are wired to both the microprocessor relays and the merging units. Um, in parallel for voltages and series for currents, and then wired back with outputs into that test set to signal that um, the either merging unit or microprocessor really has issued a trip or close, which is how we operate the equipment, of course, right? So this is a real world, real world test. On the left-hand side, it's a much shorter path. Uh, normally it would just be T0 to T1, uh, because a lot of times we just hardwire and then hardwire outputs back to a breaker. Uh, but in this case, we do have a switch. We have a, a signal over 6850 goose that goes from high voltage to low voltage. So it was a good test to see, you know, how much latency that added. On the right-hand side, the stack is, is much bigger, right? So we've got uh, the merging unit doing the signal translation. Um, that comes out uh, sampled values and goose into a switch. Physical network, right, that goes into NICs. Um, handling the PRP and reducing that down into one packet that then PCI pass throughs the hypervisor into the VM, which is labeled VPC 1A and B here, right? So much further path to go. Once it hits there, the VM has to make a decision. It's got to come all the way back to the merging unit um, and then operate the breaker, right? So which one's faster? We honestly expected, you know, this stack to be on par. We were hoping it was on par, um, or if, if anything, maybe you know, 10 to 15% slower. But what we found, and, and to be fair, we use microprocessor relays that um, most of North America uses. I'm not gonna say any brand names, but um, you know, they, they were first released maybe 10 years ago. So the, the hardware's a little bit old, but they're expected to operate fast. They were purpose built. They have FPGAs for hardware acceleration, right? Um, so let me explain the results here then. The graph on the right is uh, for one particular algorithm. This is transformer differential for those of you familiar with the ANSI numbers, 87T. Uh, it is end to end. Uh, the y axis represents um, timing. This is milli, uh, millis, I'm sorry, not milliseconds, seconds, um, which we're used to talking in cycles, the CYC there. So just divide those numbers by 60, 60 hertz for, for us. Um, the x axis represents the faults, the simulated faults that we ran. Um, many types around the transformer, so ABC is the phases neutral, um, is N there. Um, that's why we get slightly different iterations um, in, in time. But the, the bottom results are the virtualized protection and control. The top results are the microprocessors. Red indicates that the virtual system did beat the microprocessor relaying. Um, in fact, by about 20% on the low voltage side and a little bit less on the high voltage side. 
Um, a couple of things that I'd, I'd like to point out, our equipment in the lab right now, um, it is a hardened server. The CPU clock speed is 2.1 gigahertz, which is less than what's recommended by the manufacturer of the, of the software. Um, in our field pilot, we will go forward with a 2.9 gigahertz processor, and we expect our speeds to go down to correlate to that speed. Um, the second thing is there's only 1,100 faults shown here. Uh, I don't want you to think we stopped there. We did um, tens of thousands of fault iterations of different types of algorithms, and really we were on the hunt for that maximum time. We wanted to make sure there was no outlying long tail latency because in the real world that translates into a fault that's not going to get interrupted um, whenever it happens, you know, for a long period of time, which can destroy equipment, can endanger the public, um, and, and, you know, take the power down, right, for a much larger area than it needs to. So we did not find that. Everything has been operating very consistently. But the testing doesn't end there, so um, I also wanted to cover just a, a couple more, a few more topics. Redundancy and failover mechanisms. Um, some of these things are built into protocols like PTPs, BMCA, or best master clock alg algorithm. Um, we're testing that. The image on the top uh, right for you guys shows the, um, the LAN version versus WAN version. We do plan to distribute that. Um, uh, in both methods, a primary would be local and a backup would be the geographically dispersed clocks. But that traverses through a PRP network. That's the blue and the red. They are unfortunately backwards according to the um, typical convention, but forgive me for that. Uh, but we have been failing over links, failing over equipment, making sure that the seamless redundancy, you know, redundancy with no downtime um, is intact. I.O. translation redundancy. So instrument transformers were very used to having redundancy in that, but uh, protocol conversion, this would be the, I'm sorry, <laughs> the protocol type in the I.O. translation comes down to the merging unit. So what I wanted to talk about with this point was um, really the form factor. So when it comes to merging units, there's like a centralized approach where you wire everything in, um, you know, when it comes to 9.9 and develop a full packet from that unit deploy it redundantly. Um, and there's also a up and coming um, iteration of merging units which would uh, be realized by a sensor, a small sensor that would uh, issue part of a packet for 9.9 for instance, come together in a virtual merging unit, but we would still implement that redundantly. So that we look forward to testing towards the end of the year. Um, we've got physical and virtual networking. I don't really need to talk about that. It's very similar in, in failover as the, the, what I talked about earlier. And then software-defined applications. So we, we are installing the servers redundantly or active-active, but really, you know, having software-defined, uh, uh, I guess, architecture gives us the opportunity to have more places for redundancy. So the image images here really show, you know, redundant NICs uh, leading to a PRP um, uh, DAN within a PAC application. And then on the right, really, things that we don't use today but could, like LACP, um, you know, within the virtual network. And once the switches are real time and support our protocols, we can um, even have redundancy up, up in there as well. But um, cybersecurity is always a hot topic, right? So uh, starting again at the hardware layer um, and implementing, you know, typical uh, TPM and UEFI, but we want to make sure we test and that that doesn't get in the way of our latency, right? Um, Again, software definition gives us new opportunities to isolate and segment. So the graphic here shows how we separate the process bus on the left um, from the external traffic or, or the corporate traffic on the right, which is where our SCADA information would be delivered. But the VMs are all in between, right? So those virtual networks are separate indeed. Um, there's a cybersecurity app there that will allow us to do um, different types of uh, active or offensive um, monitoring. Um, this helps us meet our uh, uh, regulatory needs, which is NERC SIP, our critical infrastructure program. Um, and that, you know, begins with scanning for ports and services. And these are all things that we're doing within our lab, by the way. Um, and then looking forward to haven't done yet, but um, this will help facilitate uh, penetration testing uh, more easily than how we do it today with the, the hardware sprawl. So one of the first questions we usually get from our teams is, how do we do upgrades with this and maintenance? Um, so it will look different, um, and that's why we're trying to verify how we're going to do that in our lab now. Um, it starts, again, with the hardware. Um, you know, a lot of these are could be consumables, hard drives, um, fans, or fan filters, whatever it is, um, learning how to handle that, uh, all hot swappable. Um, 
at all things that IT is probably used to. Um, inspection and maintenance of those servers to see how they're doing, um, that can somewhat be done remotely. Um, and then patching. So um, the way it stands today with the, our setup, um, it's a little bit manual, but again, looking forward to some of the centralized management benefits that, that Vecco is going to provide for us uh, moving to the, the edge model. Um, it's very similar for the applications themselves, the, the pack applications, so they need patching as well, and they will have their own centralized management um, that has to take care of them that's separate from you know, the, the VMware, for instance. Uh, and then uh, we have to do this at scale. So um, there are industries that don't test patches before they deploy them. I think that became really evident maybe a month or so ago, but, but we do. Um, so we have to make sure that we have easy ways to test this um, which, you know, I, I showed a couple examples here of new ways to test that we don't have available to us today. One is, you know, an isolated VM in an isolated network with its dedicated NIC uh, subscribing to production traffic. The other is a completely isolated uh, test VM feeding an isolated VM on an isolated network. So um, otherwise, what we would usually do today to isolate is physical isolation. Cutouts, test switches, the error gaps in our physical schemes that we, we have to have 61850 helps facilitate that a little bit on the digital side by having modes and behaviors for those of you that are familiar, um, but goes hand in hand with some of these new methods that we'll be using. Okay, so a lot of information on this slide, but I wanted to give you guys the actual cost breakdown um, that we've been projecting for the last six years. Um, this is our projection for this substation. So if you're familiar with switching diagrams, which I hope everybody is, um, and if you're not, we don't have time to explain all of it, but um, this is one of our typical distribution stations, um, four bays of high voltage, four bays of low voltage. Um, and these are the numbers that plug into our model and you'll see the percentage difference versus our legacy relaying on the next slide. I already talked a lot about the benefits um, and I think I hit on all the bullet points, maybe except for the, the bottom one, which is really exciting for us is, you know, we don't intend to just meet, you know, the functionality of our existing devices. We want this to be a foundation for innovation. So this platform, high compute in the substation is really exciting. We can have new algorithms that do new things, collect a lot more data and help solve some of the problems that we have that are at a higher level that Ram talked about earlier. And another I test here, sorry for the small fonts, but I wanted to share with you guys the actual numbers. So um, this is our projection at the moment. Um, not surprisingly, um, the big savings are in the labor and that's due to you know the wiring differences, one form factor versus the other. Microprocessor on the left and VPAC on the right. Um, you do see a lot of green. We do expect savings just out of, out of the gate even with this. Uh, Greenfield would be brand new installations. Brownfield would be you know, us going and upgrading a site. And then the bottom is upgrade types. So when we do firmware upgrades, for instance, we still have to go get hands on the device. Um, I hate to use the term, but it's a truck roll, right? So um, it costs a lot to do that. Uh, we don't expect to have to do that moving forward. Um, so th that's why those numbers are even higher. And looking forward, um, you know, we have the ongoing activity, which most of it I've talked about. Um, we are coordinating our across our ITOT, our both departments, I should say, um, and learning how we're going to interact with each other. In fact, we have set up a separate department, um, which is the HSOC, uh, which is the High Security Operations Center, which is expected to kind of bridge that gap uh, for us. That's something that came from a study we did from ITOT years ago. Um, and of course, we do plan to do training along with our testing. In the future, we will roll out a field pilot. At first, it's going to be a single distribution base. So this is getting it out in the field um, and then expanding to that full substation um, distribution station at first over the next 20 months. Um, we'll continue driving the industry in that VPAC alliance, um, which if anybody wants to find out more about that, um, you know, please ask, ask me afterwards. Um, we'll continue to update you know, our, our cost models and make them even um, more accurate. Uh, we'll expand on uh, the data that goes to our centralized systems um, and some of these other things I mentioned. It, it is helpful, I'll, I'll say, that NERC 2016-02 has passed. Um, this helps facilitate virtualization um, in, our, in our regulatory standards. Um, and then, of course, this has to mix with our legacy devices as we first introduce it to substations. And with that, I'll pass it back over to Ron. Thank you, Anthony. So all of this that Anthony was talking about is, was, is made possible because of 
virtualizing your pack components and running it as a VM on a general purpose computer, right? Now, most of you are in a VMware show, I'm pretty much assuming that you're all familiar with vSphere. So this is very much similar to vSphere, but it has a couple of few changes, right? If you look at a traditional vSphere kind of a setup, you have your ESXi, which is the hypervisor where all your workloads run. And then you have a vCenter, which is your management plane and control plane, which, where you define your VMs. And then that's where you also uh, have your control plane function like your DRS, which does VM vMotion or VM placements and things like that. Now, that kind of a data center kind of a uh, virtualization stack uh, is not necessarily scalable for a distributed deployment uh, scenario, which is what you would need in a utility substation, where you have tens of thousands of substations, some of them ha uh, being connected over a very unreliable network connectivity, right? So uh, what we devised is a, a new product called as Edge Compute Stack. It leverages the same ESXi for running your workloads. So from a hypervisor standpoint, it's exactly the same. So the same workloads that you are used to running in the data centers will be supported even in the edge compute stack. But the distinction or the difference uh, actually comes in the management plane and control plane. Since we are assuming that these substations may not have reliable connectivity, we wanted to ensure that the control plane element is running locally within the substation or locally within the edge. So we extricated that from the management plane and pushed the control plane to the data plane. And then the other thing that we did was rather than having the management plane reach into the edge and manage it that way, we basically changed the direction of communication. So in the edge compute, you will have the data plane, which is your ESXi, reaching up to the orchestrator. So that way you don't need to open up any firewall ports or anything of that sort in your edge. It's all a HTTP, HTTPS connection. So there is no need for you to reconfigure the firewall in the substation. That's the second change that we, impact, uh, that, that we implemented. The th third change that we did was we moved away from an imperative model of uh, uh, configuration to a declarative model. What it essentially means is rather than having a VI admin sit and say, okay, hey, I want to power on this VM in this particular substation, you basically have a template, like an infrastructure as a code. I think some of you may be familiar with infrastructure as a code, where you have uh, declarative semantics, which defines what your desired state needs to be, and then the and then your uh, individual edge sites will download the desired state definition and implement the desired state definition. So in this scenario, in this case, what you're doing is you're distributing the uh, M, uh, you're distributing the uh, 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 responsibility of having uh, to implement the uh, configurations or power on, power off, all of those things. You're moving it all the way to the edge. So that's the model. Um, so here is the way how uh, you will see a typical, I mean, if you take your data center as well as these edges or the substations into consideration, this is this gives you a more of a overall picture, right? Um, where in your data center you have your typical VCF, where you have your traditional ARIA, NSX, all those components running, and you have all your data center workloads, but then when it comes to the substation, which is primarily the distributed edge, that you have edge compute running both your real-time applications, which is the pack application, as well as your non-real-time application, which could be either your AIML application or your security applications. Some of them do run uh, vi security visibility apps at the substation level, and that's something that you can run on edge compute stack with the orchestrator that you saw in the previous slide running as a VM in the data center. So you still have the management plane centralized, but the control plane is completely distributed uh, uh, deep into the edges themselves. Okay, I think that was, uh, so here is the eye level architecture. So what we did was in order to bring in this kind of a functionality, we introduced something called as an edge agent that is running in the runtime, which is uh, periodically reaching up to the orchestrator, checking for any changes that needs to be applied locally. 
So that change, those changes are actually uh, stored in the Git repository. And these are essentially YAML definitions. And you use your typical CACD pipeline-based methodology to distribute all these changes across your uh, hundreds or thousands of substations. So that's really the deployment and provisioning model going forward. So that was the last slide. Uh, so uh, I think we do have some time to take questions. If you have uh, any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer them. And there is a microphone in the front, so please feel free to uh, come to the front and ask your question. Not uh, quite familiar with the edge optimized runtime. So in this case, when you're showing that smart meter app, so if I am developing a smart meter app, how my deployment works? So I need to work with the VCF, or like for example, I, if I draw a parallel, I have this AWS green grass, right? I can directly deploy those, my app through that green grass. So can you walk me through how exactly I deploy my application to this edge edge stack? Sounds good. So. Is your app a containerized app or a VM? Containerized app, okay. So then the way you will do is you will have the container definition, right? And then you will, for your app, you will be writing a Helm chart, right? To deploy your container pod, you will probably have a Helm chart. So take that Helm chart and then you, but then you need to write an YAML file, which is essentially a declarative semantics for your particular container app. So the YAML file will specify what are the environmental requirements, how much CPU capacity you need, what is the memory capacity, what is the networking requirements, you are using static IP, dynamic IP, all of those definitions. Define all of those requirements in the YAML file, and then once you push it into the Git repo, the uh, Git repo to which the runtime is already uh, attached to, then the app will be automatically downloaded and uh, uh, deployed in the uh, edge. You don't need to do anything beyond that point. Your responsibility ends with you pushing that YAML file or YAML update into the Git repository. Yeah. Any other questions? Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate uh, you all coming to the session. <clears throat>